So um, well, welcome everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so if you've come to see uh, a little bit of a chat from the people who went to the OST course in, in Canberra and to talk about what they discovered there and what they learned uh, and to find out a little bit more about that, then you're in the right place. Our intention here is to, uh, if you like, uh, get more of the word out on, on what open systems theory is by sharing our experience of, of the course. Um, the course was run um, in uh, February, uh, and we were lucky enough to have the esteemed Dr. Um, Marilyn Emery and Peter uh, take us through that OST course. Um, systems at play, if you're new to it, is um, something that's been around for quite a while now. Um, go back to the slide, please. Now, well, the slides are pretty slow. It's been around for a while. Um, basically, we're now up to 392 members in the Systems at Play community across six co continents, uh, 34 countries, 111 cities. But we haven't added them all up uh, for a while because it's um, <laughs> because it's uh, it's a little bit tricky to do that. Um, next slide, please, Mahal. Welcome also anybody who's new to the Systems at Play space. We've had quite a few different speakers in here. Um, our journey to uh, put on the OST course. Uh, well, what happened was about two years ago, uh, we were actively looking across the, um, the environment uh, with the Systems at Play community, looking at different speakers and different things out there in the, in the world, uh, looking at systems thinking. So we explored some, some systems dynamics and we explored viable systems thinking, you know, some critical um, thinking works as well. Uh, and we wound up um, actually coming across um, OST uh, eventually. Uh, it actually happened when Alidad was actually having a sort of a Twitter, let's say conversation discussion uh, with, with Trond. And uh, I don't know if it got very heated, but it certainly got very informative. And what we, what we saw was that our, our interest was, was peaked. And we saw that as um, people were getting more dissatisfied with, if you like, with how um, organizations were, were were working, uh, we thought it was something that was quite applicable and quite uh, accessible, if you like, to a degree, and certainly well formed in terms of its history that we want to know more about it. So we, we found out that um, Marilyn, who is probably the, the greatest uh, exponent and sort of uh, founder of the open systems theory space, along with her husband, who's no longer with us, actually lived in Canberra and was willing to put on a course uh, we would have found this out, by the way, if we hadn't actually contacted um, Peter, uh, Peter Orton, who's on the call as well. And with the help of Peter and Trond, we are able to actually put on a course down in, in Canberra with Marilyn. It, um, it wasn't a success in terms of making money. <laughs> we probably lost a, fair, a little bit of money on it and a lot of time. But what we, we gained was much more. Um, we, we gained a lot of knowledge about open systems theory and how um, search conferences uh, particip participative design workshops and um, uh, unique designs are done. And we also learned a lot about um, about the, the different parts or different sort of like techniques and tools within there as well. Um, our intention also wasn't so much to, like I say, make money from, from this, in, in this in this instance, but more to learn for ourselves, but also then to help to get uh, OST out into the community. And knowing that Marilyn's uh, in her 80s also to make sure that we can carry on and protect her legacy as well. So who have we got here today? Well, I'll get everybody to introduce themselves, but basically the course wasn't enormous. Like I said, I think we had how many? Nine people, including Marilyn. Uh, so eight people, or seven people sort of participating um, and Peter and, and Marilyn co sort of hosting it as well. Um, so with that, I think we'll um, open it up to the, the first question. Um, and we'll go through each of the panelists. Uh, um, I'll just come off mute and start talking when you get a chance. Uh, introduce yourselves, and then uh, it's about what the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> we won't do that quite yet. We jump do have a channel. <laughs> <laughs> we did jump the gun. We do have a um, a uh, YouTube channel where we place the videos from um, Systems at Play. So if you want to see any of the um, past Systems at Play um, meetups, they're all all there. Um, this one will also be placed there when we've edited all of the puns out of the intro. So <laughs> with that, I'll, we'll turn off the screen, I guess, or is there another slide? There is another slide, yes. There is another slide, okay. 
that's it. That's the okay. slide, Dave. Cool. So with what we're going to do is a sort of a um, modified approach to fishbowl. Uh, we ask people to um, only come off off um, off mute to ask questions if if there's time to do so. In the meantime, put uh, questions into the chat so that we can respond to them. We're going to kick off with the not four panelists, but how many have we got today? I think it's six. Is it seven? Six or seven? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the first question we oh, eight is it? We have flash. No, I was facilitating. Here. So. Oh yeah, um, so. yeah. Okay. Cool. So I'll hand over to um, to Ali then to facilitate the the fishbowl. Take it away. Okay, thanks for those who've just joined. Um, welcome. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about our experience in the open system theory or thinking theory actually is the right one. Uh, that was conducted in Canberra with Marilyn Emery and Peter Arthur. Uh, we have Peter tonight with us. And uh, the way we're gonna do it is, is a modified version of the fishbowl as Dave mentioned. Um, if you have been a fishbowl, perfect. This is going to be a modified version of it. Uh, if you haven't, the way it's going to work is the panelists uh, are in a fishbowl and you're all watching them. And uh, we will ask, start with the opening theme. The panelists will int introduce themselves and under answer the question. And then if you have any questions um, during the chat, if you go shark ball, yes, well, hopefully not. Um, we keep it, we keep it um, civilized <laughs> as much as possible. Um, so, um, so your questions, type them in the chat, uh, and then we pause um, at certain points after all the panelists talk. We pause. The, whoever asked the first question, we ask them to sort of turn their camera on if they can, and uh, they join the fishbowl. And for the duration of that that period, they can also be part of the panelists and answer any other question related to that particular topic. And then the next question and the next question. And we'll see how we go. We try to keep it fluid. It's, it's mostly about sharing the experience of the panelists uh, as part of the six day training, um, immersive training. But um, if other topics also came in, we will, we will, we will go with the flow. Um, and, and we try to keep it short, you know, five, 10 minutes for each questions, um, if it's possible. But again, you know, we will see how the conversation flow. Um, and again, normally uh, the way we run fishbowl is if you ask a question, you join the pa panelists and you stay there. But we were experimenting with this immersive view of the Zoom and it's, it doesn't work for everyone. So we thought, you know, instead of doing that, we'll just do a modified version. Um, before we begin, again, if you've just joined, um, we're recording this conversation. We will obviously edit it and put it up in our YouTube channel uh, later. Um, during the conversation, when the panelists are talking, if I may ask everyone to put them, themselves on mute, I was gonna suggest for everyone else other than the panelists to turn their videos off as well. But I think panelists, I don't know, what do you prefer guys? Do you prefer if you can see your audience? I would if I was a panelist. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah? Okay. So yeah, keep, keep your videos on. Faces. I think that's that's pre probably preferred. We want to see the faces. So keep your videos on. All good, but stay on mute. Um, and again, ask your questions in the chat. All right? And then we'll go through them one by one. So with that, I um, if there is no question, is there any question? No? So... With that, I will um, I will start with the opening question. So our panel obviously are Monica from New Zealand, Tron from uh, Norway. We have Peter from obviously Australia. I don't know where you are at the moment, Peter. You can tell us later. Dave, um, Michal, Ross, and Andy. Um, so they are all our, our panelists. They know who they are. So. Um, I will start with the opening question uh, that is, what got you into OSD and the course? And what did you expect from the course? Who wants to start? Well, maybe uh, I'll jump in with the 
profession. Um, Stop from Ross Tara and then Brian's head coach uh, in, in Melbourne. Um, I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> so it was uh, a bit of a, a jump into, into the dark. So sometimes I feel that um, you just have to trust that something exciting is happening somewhere and open yourself to new experience. So um, I kind of said, I, I knew you guys at, at System to Play were doing something cool. And I I just I thought, OK, it sounds cool. I'll do it. Um, and I'm glad I did because when I, I read into it and I read the, the course materials and experience in first hand, it's probably been one of the most uh, important courses I've been on over the last few years. And um, so, yeah, not not the, the perfect answer, but uh, I can talk about why I love it later. Thanks, Russ. Who's next? Uh, by the way, once you finish, maybe um, maybe nominate the next person. That would be easy. Hey. Okay, um, uh, Monica. Yes. I was hoping to go last. Okay. Um, I think I was the last addition to, to this workshop. So I got an email from Peter. I had actually had the pleasure to interview Marilyn um, a couple of years ago for um, something that a university I was attending in the States. Um, they were doing a series of luminaries in OD and she and her husband's work, Fred Emery's, was considered part of that sort of, you know, legacy that OD had in terms of open systems theory. So this wasn't the first time I had to. <laughs> so I've read the book two years ago, but I actually couldn't read it. Like I tried to read it, but it was so difficult that I actually asked for a translator and that's how I met Peter. So Peter actually translated the book for me in a way that, that makes sense. And so I I wasn't sure if I could actually um, attend attend the workshop and so but things aligned and thanks to Dave Alidad and Mihail made it uh, really easy for me to sort of attend and so um, I had great expectations in terms of learning particular things so I wasn't. Um, my thing wasn't around the searching but was mostly around trying to understand the BDW uh, in, in the sense that um, I work quite a bit with uh, organizations in terms of uh, organizing and restructuring. So that's one of the reasons that um, I found myself traveling to Canberra. And because it was supposed to be done in over two weekends, I actually stayed there for 11 days. And so that was a long, long time. Uh, and I'm going and to Monica, yeah? introduce yourself as well, just a little bit about yourself. Tell us about yourself. Okay. Um, so I am an OD practitioner. I've been working on the field of OD for about 20 plus years. Um, I have a global practice. Um, and by global, I mean I don't have any customers in New Zealand. Um, I work mostly in applied complexity, so I use complexity science, and I see John Laurie. I've never met her, but I've seen you uh, also work in that space. Uh, but I work basically with different um, um, lines of or different ways of actually applying complexity thinking into into businesses, and. Um, and, and that's me. I'm, I'm not very good about talking about me. <laughs> so I'm going to pass on to Dave. God, why did I know I'd be next? Um, really, I'll really be really quick this time as well. Um, I'm working as an Agile coach at the moment, but really not happy with Agile coaching. So I was looking for something to challenge and change the way I approach the way that I work. When we came across OST, what I really wanted to do in, in part of going to this course was actually see how it's actually done. So the course for me was to see practically how um, Maryland actually applies the, the learnings or the, the, what I read. Uh, I want to know more about how that was applied. And that's, that's sort of what it delivered as well. And then getting that experience both from, from Peter and Maryland was really what I was there for. And I'll throw over to Peter. Thanks, Dave. Um, I was introduced to open systems theory 30 years ago. I attended Maryland's course. And um, at the time I was employed, just employed, uh, as an OD consultant for a consultancy 
inv involved in continuous improvement. So the consultancy was teaching uh, continuous improvement project teams about the tools and techniques of TQM, JIT, Lean, et cetera. And um, my role was to take the, the concept of the self-managing continuous improvement team and scale it across the organisation. Because at the time, um, things started to plateau when they, they, they got impressive, impressive results initially in using those tools and techniques to improve line efficiencies, reduce waste, uh, improve quality. Uh, but things started to plateau. So um, management was saying, how do we scale this? How do we get this learning across the whole organisation? And that's why I was employed by um, this consultancy to take uh, the, the learning that was coming from these little self-managing groups who were focusing on continuous improvement and then scale that across the organisation. And as I said to uh, the guys, um, I, I put together a, um, a little paper um, that introduced my OST case studies over the last 30 years. And, and a lot of them initially involved manufacturing because that's where the TQM continuous improvement uh, tools and techniques were focused. Um, I came to the realization that. It was a deja vu, deja vu sense for me because what the Agile coaches and Trondon were saying was that Agile is setting up these cross-functional teams to improve the, the development of uh, IT products and so forth, but they weren't able to scale. So I, I saw there was a lot of similarities between what I was doing 30 years ago and what's happening now with Agile. And there are a lot of lessons from that experience of 25 plus years ago that could be picked up by the Agile community. So that's, uh, if you like, my contribution to the, the course and to also outline the application of open systems theory, which is basically a social science methodology to help organisations um, prosper and remain stable in environments that are rapidly changing and highly unpredictable. And you'll hear about uh, two methodologies that are translated from open system theory. One is the search conference, which is a, which is a large group strategic planning process that helps management develop what's called active adaptive strategic goals and plans. And that's about not only adapting to the fast changing environment, but how do we uh, create um, a, uh, active plans that influence the environment for the betterment of the, the organization and the community. And the other process is the participative design workshop, which is you can't have these active adaptive strategic goals and bureaucratic structures, which are highly inflexible and rigid. You need a new structure that's team-based and where the basic unit is the self-managing team. So the participative design workshop was specifically developed to transform a bureaucratic organization. And in OST um, terminology, it's known as design principle one or DP1 into a DP2 organization, which is a team-based structure where the basic unit work as a self-managing group. So uh, my role in that uh, course was to actually help Marilyn uh, uh, give examples of the application, if you like, of the, the two key methodologies. So that's me in, in uh, five minutes or so. Uh, who else, who haven't we had? Mihail, have you had a, a go yet? No, I can go. Thanks, Peter. Apologies, guys. Uh, I may my connection is really, really bad and unstable, so it may be breaking up. But 
Yeah, Mikhail, uh, agile coach. Reason for getting in OST was that, um, as Dave and Ali had mentioned over the past two years, we were looking through all sorts of systems thinking approaches, and this sounded really, really applicable to me. Um, again, coming from uh, an engineering background, uh, IT, very structured, very sequential uh, way of thinking. Uh, this was just trying to uh, get me out of that shell and start thinking a bit differently. I think uh, Marilyn mentioned, you know, said it really, really nicely when we met, uh, probably two, three weeks before the course. She said, uh, oh, I'm going to get that out of Mihail for sure, kind of knocked out of Mihail. Uh, so it was a challenge really to, to get into areas that were different from what I'm used to. Uh, and again, systems thinking and cybernetics, I had a university, but that's very different from this. This is a uh, way of thinking that you have to kind of pull back. And uh, Monica also mentioned for the book, I pretty much started reading it three times before I could start digesting the language properly. And then it started slowly flowing. But when this uh, uh, opportunity came up to do the course, uh, I think all three of us, um, Dave, Elliot, and myself, just locked in on it and didn't want to let it go. And hindsight, uh, it was way more than what I expected. It was really, really, really good to hear it from uh, how Marilyn is uh, approaching it, how she represents uh, the content. And most importantly, uh, yeah, she knocked me back a couple of times. Uh, by saying, hey, Mihail, no, that won't work. And the guys were basically uh, there. So very happy with the course. I would love to do it again, actually. So let's see, maybe we'll be lucky. Okay, I'll transfer maybe to uh, Alidad. Okay, I'm not supposed to say anything. I'm a facilitator, right? Um, all I say is, um, hi everyone, I'm Alida. Most of you know you, me, so I won't introduce myself again. This was by far the best professional course I have done in my entire career. And nothing, no course I've done, I've done a fair bit of courses, came as close to this. Um, and coming from um, sort of agile coaching, we do a lot of facilitation, group facilitation techniques, big room plannings, whole lot of things. Not only was a master class for facilitation and techniques, because the person who was doing that, and as well as Peter, you know, both both Peter and Marilyn, they approach it from a um, um, more uh, sociology perspective as well. So anyway, I don't go into that too much. Um, I. If, if, if it's okay, I can, I'll can i hand over to someone else and then maybe I'll join. No, no, no. You're just there. teasing us. You've taken off the facilitator hat. Why was it the greatest ever, Alladay? You've got additional. I will, I will answer that question in the next section. <laughs> but um, I think Dave and, and one of the reasons I'm not, I'm, I'm not, because the question is how did you come about uh, OST? And I think Dave and Michal already, already answered that question. So yeah. Um, so I think I'll um, pass it on to Andy, and then maybe the last person would be Tron. Um, Andy, introduce yourself, and how did you come over to OST? So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Andy Moore. I am working as a Agile coach in Sydney. Um, I came across uh, <laughs> OST through Aladad and Dave. <laughs> okay? I had no idea what I was going on. Uh, and it was it was just came up at a perfect time, and I I knew I needed to in, improve in my systems thinking space. But what actually made me fall in love with um, OST very quickly once I started looking into it is the fact that <laughs> I, I have a personal fear um, that we 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 we've gone into a time with increasingly polarized. Um, ways of looking at the world and it becomes very difficult to talk about anything and what I saw very quickly was was OST had pragmatic ways of helping people approach and understand each other's point of view and work through different points of view 
without insisting on complete agreement and still generate um, pragmatic outcomes. And the, the thinking behind it and, and the way I could see how that would work, it, it, blew, me, it, it blew me away. It was, it was really great. Um, uh, and also just to add to that, Marilyn is an absolute weapon, okay? <laughs> And at the age, what is she, 84, something like that, guys? Um, she outdrank us, out-energised us, out, um, I don't know what, well, out-brained us. I mean, that's, I think that's, you know, she's was a force of nature, absolutely brilliant person to study with and, and be around, so, yeah. Um, Thanks, and Andy. And I think Tron yeah. would be the last person. That would be me, yes. Uh, just, uh, just want to start off with what Annie said. I completely agree. She is, she is the force of force of nature. Uh, very much a surprise, actually, how how uh, how how energized uh, she is, still can, can be after so many years. So yeah, I'm Tron Jotland. I'm from Oslo, Norway. So good good morning from from actually sunny Oslo. Um, turning to spring here, so it's always nice. Um, my trajectory has been not too dissimilar to Mihal. Actually, uh, my background uh, originally was in natural sciences. And then I moved into IT because of the dot com bottle bubble, like many of, of us did happen back then. Um, and then worked as programmer and now mostly architecture for social uh, solution architecture or enterprise architecture, stuff like that now. Uh, and my uh, journey into OST actually has started a few years back. Um, out of frustration of, of how uh, how bad we were at organizing teams around domains, really, because I was really into something called domain-driven domain design uh, back then, and still are, by the way. But uh, I saw that the importance of having team structure is, is just as important as the technical uh, sort of uh, boundaries. Um, and then, of course, Agile was there as well, and I was frustrated by that because it worked sometimes, and sometimes it really didn't work, and why was that? And then I started reading up on social, uh, social technical system design. I believe I came to that via via systems thinking though. So 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 system thinking was probably the first uh, encounter, eighth of for example and stuff like that. And then reading a lot of papers, and then this is the COVID hit, and I had certainly a lot of time reading. So uh, so I read a fair bit of papers from 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 uh, from going back to to uh, to Tristan Emery and then all the way up to the most recent things. And then suddenly just came across this OST thing that sort of seemed like one one of the strands that grew out of social technical system design. There are several others, which some I do understand, some I do not. Like the lowlands one, I struggle with. But anyway, but OST seemed to like hit uh, hit the chord because it reminded me of how we were of of of, of agile and agility. What we tried to uh, sort of what we tried to do basically. You know? Um, and then, uh, as mentioned earlier, I got it into not an argument, but a discussion with Alidad on, on Twitter. Um, I think because I followed him because of his system thinking. Um, and then I, I think I just suggest that there, are, there is something called open system theory. Are you familiar with it? And that triggered off the whole thing, really. Then, And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm so happy that they actually then uh, managed to organize uh, this course because um, I was kind of struggling myself to figure out how should I take this further because again, again reading papers is one thing, but how can I? How can, because I wanted to, to actually move into this uh, this field and how to do that. Uh, and I checked with some universities here, and I also checked in Canada and see if there was any places I could learn also open system theory. And so when Alida suggested that, well, we what about doing a, uh, putting uh, together a course in Australia? I think, oh, of course I could do that. But okay, the travel is a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a stretch. But uh, so I had a bit back and forth. Should I really do this because it's going to be expensive and all that? And being a consultant, that's always a, a yeah, it's a challenge. Um, but I, I soon figured out this is a once in a once in a lifetime opportunity, so I just had to do it. And it really was. It, I mean, I'm so glad I did, and I think I would have regretted it for the rest of my life if I hadn't done it. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time in, in Australia. Meeting Marilyn was a fantastic treat. You see, it's, she is a force of nature, so, so she, she's strict when it comes to her, 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 her topic, because she knows it well, but she's also a lovely lady. So, it, I mean, it, it was a wonderful experience. I'm meeting Peter in live and also, of course, the rest of the group. And I see we are starting to forming our community around OST, which is missing. There isn't a real community about OST. I, they have tried a few years, and Peter might get into that later on, but it has sort of fizzled out. So I'm part of an STS group, Social Technical Systems Design Group uh, in Norway. 
And there are a few of those sort of round tables around the world, but they are like geographical, right? So they are very local. We, in, like in Norway, we do it in Norwegian, for example. So it's very local. Uh, but there's no OST community as far as I know. So uh, this could be a start of our OST community. At least that's what I hope grows out of this, this, uh, this wonderful course that we did. Yeah, that's me. Thank you so much, Trond. I think we covered everyone. Um, did I miss anyone? I don't think we did. I did. So um, I'm going to break through edition a bit. There, there are a few questions here, but I, let me ask you questions from the um, participant and the audience. Um, is there anyone who is not familiar with OSC at an at a introduction and basic level? Our assumption was, oh, OK, Gareth, yeah. Anyone else not familiar with OSC? OK, all right, two or three. Um, our um, assumption was because we the, the previous um, session we had in System as Play was about OSD and, and the current introduction of OSD with a focus on PDW that Peter um, uh, presented. But I'm going to put a really, really difficult task before I jump into the first question on, on the panelists. Is any of you willing? And I know if we, we promise, um, Marilyn will never hear about it. Okay. Um, anyone of you are willing to, in a few minutes, very short, just um, explain at a very high level what OSC is. And I know it's an impossible task because we did a six day course and we still can't, you know, it, it took us that much. But um, just for folks, just to get their head around what are we talking about um, in a few minutes. Anyone is willing to do that? Volunteer for it. I, I can have a go, but I, I guess Peter would probably be uh, the best one. But uh, since most of you are sort of probably more or less unfamiliar with it, okay. maybe my take would be could, could be one. Um, go for it. Yeah. So yeah. So let me try. Yeah, so, short. Um, okay. Keep to, it short. I'll yeah, I'll let you know if it was going too long. <laughs> cool. Good. 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 Yeah, because uh, coming in from 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 system thinking, I think I would like to focus on why it's called open system theory, right? So uh, because when we look at social technical system design, which I have done quite a bit, uh, it's you really don't look into the environment that much. You took you think about the system and the parts and how they interact and all that good uh, goodness that uh, system thinking and sort of uh, brings us understanding the whole. And then we look at the social system with, with the parts done is of course uh, people. And the social technical side, there's people, but there's also technology. So we need to uh, start jointly optimize that. That's social technical system design. But but then um, Fred Emery was really inspired by von Wörthland about his open systems uh, thinking. So he took that and said that, okay, we have a system, yes, and there is an environment like von Wörthland uh, acknowledged. It is there, but it's, it's, uh, it's sort of handling its way and it's, Yes, it affects us and we affect them, but it doesn't really, it, it's just there. It can sort of uh, manage, on, manage on its own. So what, what Fred Emery did together with Trist is that they conceptualized the environment. So they took that really in uh, into, so they, they said that the environment and the system can't be disconnected. They are, they are inherently connected. They are, uh, they are sort of, um, uh, they are, they in, in a way, you can see them as a system as a whole, in a, in a way, but that's also quite a reductionist, but you can't separate them anyway. You, you can't ignore the, the environment. So that's where I think the open system theory as a thought co uh, sort of comes in. And then all the practices that, that we're gonna probably uh, get into here, it's, it's, it's about managing that interaction between the environment and the system. So, so that's my short take on it. Peter, you may have some additional thoughts and input on it. Yeah, thanks, Tron. Um, yeah, Emery and Trist um, back in the 1965, I think it was, uh, published their seminal paper on what was called um, the directive uh, directive correlations, was it? Um, anyway, no, the co uh, co uh, causal textures. Causal te texture of directive correlations, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but what Emery noticed after the Second World War, when particularly when Russia and the US dropped their thermonuclear bombs, people started to realize, well, the nation state can't look after me anymore. I've got to take things into my own hands. And that's where you got changes in what they call the extended social field, the environment that's made up of 
you, me, all the all the other people around the world that that social field, um, and that started to change. So you then got the uh, the cultural revolution starting to uh, happen late fifties, sixties, seventies, where you got you know groups, different groups forming the green groups, environmental groups, equality groups, and and so forth. So you got this environment that was starting to change people started to uh their values and expectations expectations started to change which had an impact on what products and services they buy and how they use those products and services and how they buy them so that created uh an environment for organizations that was highly uncertain unpredictable so emery and particularly fred then started to pioneer the the social science theory called open systems theory to help organizations cope with that dramatically changing environment and that's what we uh, learned about during the course and we also learned about two key methodologies that i mentioned earlier the search conference for planning in that environment and the participative design workshops for designing organisations to be able to adapt and have high levels of agility in that environment. So that's where it's come from. And um, the guys learned about in detail those methodologies and how to apply them. Thanks, Peter. Um, what I've got to do is we've got to ask two questions from um, the ones that are in the chat. You don't need the, the the panelists don't all of them need to answer. If someone answer and you're satisfied, all good. If you think you can add, please add. Because after these two questions, we're gonna add, ask a second question, which is um, about your experience and your aha moments in the course. There were plenty for me. The, it was a paradigm shifting course for me, and I want to give you opportunity to talk about them and the audience to hear that. But I will go through two questions from the chat and then whoever wants to answer them, please. If the rest of the panelists don't think you, you wanna add anything to that, that's cool, we move on to the next one. So uh, the question is from Martin. Uh, the first question is about PDW and search conference. Martin, did you wanna ask that question yourself? Yeah, happy to. Um... Did you want me to do an intro as I did that? Is that the idea? Please go yeah. for it. Um, so as you're probably uh, discovering in the chat, if uh, if you read it, um, the, the, there's uh, the, there's an element of pedantry go coming on here. <laughs> um, hopefully not in too bad a way. Um, I, I have a background in um, systems thinking from the 90s when I studied it and then basically gave it up because I just thought it was too hard. And, uh, and I couldn't, it was brilliant, but uh, unless everyone adopts this system thinking, you're like the only person in the room that is trying to push a systems agenda, at which point, you know, I gave up. Um, and in the last uh, maybe year or so, um, I've sort of uh, discovered some other systems thinkers and sort of uh, then that encourages me to uh, to come out. Um, and so that's my background in this area. Um, I'm sort of still somewhat skeptical as to the practical application of systems thinking, um, but I am enthusiastic about the ideas. Um, and then, so then it comes down to practical application, participative design workshop, search conference. I don't know a huge amount about them. Um, I, I think of one as a mechanism to, uh, to effectively explore the environment and the other as a mechanism by which um, individuals get involved in designing their own future. Um, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong on that, um, but I'd like to understand how the two fit with each other. But is that a, that's probably a big question. 
that's a massive question. That's the entire OST course, but uh, we, we try to keep it short and quick. Peter, I see you took yourself off yeah. mute. Did, did you wanna briefly answer that? And then if any other panelists. Yeah, so the search conference is a, a large group, strategic planning methodology. So large, I'm talking about 30, 35 people. Um, in the room. So you've got all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in the room. And as you go through the search conference and the participative design workshops, they're not only designed to uh, develop strategic plans and new organizational structures, but they're also designed to teach you about the methodology so that you can continue to adapt as the environment changes. So one of the key things you, you learn about in the um, search conference is how to scan and analyze the external environment. And that that learning, it becomes innate for you. You, you will, and I, I do it all the time now, I'm continually uh, scanning the environment myself. Um, what's happening out there? What are the embryonic changes that, that are occurring that could be a threat to an organization or could be an opportunity? So the management team starts to think in terms of um, scanning the environment, being able to analyse it. And often for organisations, the environment consists of its industry that it belongs to and that extended social field that I talked about before where there's, where there's discontinuous change, where people are changing their minds about all sorts of things. And then... And then through the process, uh, you learn to develop um, active, adaptive, strategic goals and plans. And as I mentioned before, those, because the environment's changing, your goals can't be set in concrete. You, you're continually looking at your strategic goals and are they going to get us to where we want to be in five years' time or whatever the planning horizon is. So um, it becomes a way, particularly for management, of doing their, their work, their strategic planning. And as I mentioned before, you can't have highly adaptive strategic goals um, and then a fixed rigid bureaucratic structure. You've got to have moved to a team-based structure where there's high levels of motivation, intrinsic motivation, where people control and coordinate the work that they do and responsible for the goals of the team that they belong to. So if the strategic goals change, then management can quickly renegotiate goals, say at the operational level. Um, and then, so you get that adaptability, uh, agility occurring right through the organisation. And that's where I see it uh, as a, a really good fit to Agile, where they're trying to create these Agile teams that can help develop um, IT products quickly, um, get them out there in so many days, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's where I think Agile is a great um, conceptually way of doing, uh, of organizing IT specialists, product uh, specialists, but, um, it hasn't got that social science theory sitting behind it. And if it gets that social science theory of understanding the design principles, design principle one, bureaucracy, design principle two, uh, the self-managing group, then it can see why, why is it working in this organization, Agile, and not in that organization? Why are we getting these tensions? Why, and you start to understand well, where it's not working, we've got mixed mode. We've got a combination of bureaucracy and self-managing teams working together and they create tensions. And I've seen that for the last 30 odd years where you uh, have to really, when you're designing an, an organisation, you have to make sure you're not getting that mixed mode. You're not getting what we call laissez-faire where management try to set up teams and um, just remove the supervisor and let people do what they like, which is worse than bureaucracy. So there are some really key theoretical com uh, concepts 
and the methodologies that could, and that, this is my belief, it really enhanced the Agile movement because they will be underpinned by this um, uh, theoretical knowledge, conceptual knowledge of what works and what doesn't. So that's Hi. my take. Thanks, Peter. Monica, I think you want to add yeah, something there. I, I, just, I just probably want to come to to, to actually share. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably um, going to come from, from a different angle, which is um, the, I, what I see of this methodology, and there's a, a few things around, around change, how is this different, um, why hasn't it spread? I, I think I'm, I'm going to try to be very concise on this, but one of the things with these two methods in which uh, OST is expressed is the fact that first of all is from the ground up so you cannot reapply it and there's no best practice so you cannot clone it all right and most of the movements around the world are clonable so give me the five steps and this is what i'm going to do this is not what happened here so if you think about um, setting a strategy there are many other methodologies that could replace searching Right, so I, I don't want to say that's the only way or that's the best way, it's a way. What's interesting about the method is that as you go through the method, there's, for example, something called the rationalization of conflict, all right, where, where actually people are addressing these things and they are, that's the best appro approximation that you have to actually not seeking alignment, but actually looking for a coherent strategy, all right? And in many senior teams, the other thing is who comes to that searching conference. Okay, so it actually is not just the management team, but it also involves all the kinds of people that you want to have sitting at the table to start discussing these things. So it's not the application of somebody that thought about something and then somebody else is going to apply it. So you have that difference there is a difference that makes a difference in that particular group and also the steps and how they actually talk about it. So. If you're thinking in organizational development, there's usually two camps, you know, the ones that come and diagnose you and say, you you know, you're absolutely sick and these are the five things that you have to do. And there's something called dialogic, which is, it's all about the exchanges that we have and through the exchanges is that we learn. And in OST, that's called puzzle learning. It's not puzzle because it's hard, but because the idea is that we all hold, you know, pieces of what we are seeing and together we put it together to sort of find out what's the best future for us, which is contextual. In the other part of the workshop where you start doing the design of it, what is beautiful about it, because there are many schools of design, is that it's based on a principle that goes beyond what just the enterprise wants, which is usually more money, right? Now, what it does, it, it's, it's embedded within it. There are other principles that have to do with actually humans. Now, we, we talk all the time about humans, but this is how do we create the best conditions? And that's why I was attracted to this is because in complexity theory, we're always looking at what are the conditions that you have to create in order for whatever. But in this case, if you look at the principles and you look at all the other things, it's all about creating these coherent environment for people to do their, their best. Now, we've talked about self-managing teams, but there's also something called these um, unique designs. So there's also flexibility. So it's not a one size fits all. And we know that when we start talking to Alice, when I talk to senior managers about design and restructures and what it looks like, there's a lot of conversations around power. There's a lot of conversations who does what when. Well, what, what is interesting about the, the model and what, what comes out of it is that you're actually, what you're doing is restructuring the, the uh, not only the, the, the way things are done, or who controls what, but also the coordination of that work. So that's the beauty of it. So it has a lot of parts where you are actively doing the change and doing the learning at the same time. So if you were looking at, different instructions around design. You know, this is something that could fit. And I think I, I do agree with Peter that it fits in the agile context probably better than in other contexts, because in agile, you've already proven, A, that is very, you, you know, you have your manifesto and a series of documents that say that you are very human driven, so that you're acknowledging that. 
you're looking for more, not just efficiency, but effectiveness. And you are unafraid of actually committing to new models that have not been tested, right? In, in, a, in a strict business world, we, we are looking for, has anybody tried it? Does it work? But in your environment, you are uh, great pioneers. And, and I think that's why th this methodology probably could be very helpful, um, you know, unsustainable in the environment that you guys work. I'm sorry, that was a long spill. I'm going to stop. No, thanks, Monica. Thanks. That was amazing. Um, so any other panelists wants to add anything to answer Martin or should, should, shall we move on to the next question? Okay. So Martin, yes, it is possible to run PDW separately if you've already somehow come up, came up with the strategic goals. And yes, it is possible to only do search. But as Peter said, a key element of doing search is the active adaptive um, strategy and objectives and goals. And if you don't have a, um, a um, democratic organization or, or, or responsive organization, it'd be hard. You can still do it. Nothing to stop you to do that, but it won't be as effective. Um, second question, and then we will go jump into the experience of the participant of the course. Um, Amelia, you had a question about change management. Uh, I did, but um, I think Monica actually answered it, to be honest. So um, mm -hmm. I, I think um, what you said, Monica, really resonated with me. Um, I was furiously typing notes. Um, but I think you you um, very well articulated what you think is different about this framework or about this way of um, designing organizations or changing organizations to be uh, more effective um, and more driven uh, to achieve what they need. So uh, I think we can move on to the next part. Aladad, thank you. No worries. Thanks, Amelia. So the next question is, uh, and I want to kind of make it a bit more interesting. So we all have, you know, our, got our own experience in the past and we've done a lot of courses as well as on day-to-day -day basis. Most of us are into the business of change. Um, my question from panelists is, what was some of your aha moments, some of the things that you discovered and it excited you during the six days of course and then obviously after that, you know, our ongoing study and training. What are a few of the things? And again, if you can stay brief, that would be amazing. But um, but I don't. I also don't want to lose the um, your excitement about it. So, what excited you? What was aha moment? What was unique? Unique about the things that you learned in the course? Who like to start? Uh, probably I can start, uh, guys. I think it was uh, again, uh, Trond, as you said uh, about Marilyn. Yeah, she was a power to be reckoned with. Uh, one of the things was as we went through the search conference, there is mechanics, there are steps that you go through and was like, why does this work? How does this work? And the example that Monica, um, sorry, that uh, uh, Marilyn or Peter gave was basically of a group of totally this, you know, pe uh, people that are totally different. I think it was to do with social workers, some coming from the bush, you know, almost hippie dressed, and some coming from the city, like uh, you know, earrings and everything else, and they're here to come in and work together on a uh, creating um, a strategy for social work. So they did kind of gel together and started working from you know the get go. So for us, coming from agile, the storming you know forming storming norming performing model is like, well, hang on, they probably need time and. Uh, yeah, Marilyn said, no, nah, this just gets them together. And only after we finished the whole process, she basically said, look, there are layering underneath what you see. And the layering is that you're naturally making the people to start trusting each other to build trust. So you start with some general stuff where you don't have conflict, like what do you think was important in the past seven years or the future seven years? And with something like that, you start with non-contentious things and slowly, slowly come to, hey, uh, we actually are talking the same story here. We are you know, both thinking the same way, but it just the process naturally builds that trust and the, you know, the people start working as a team. That was one. Second thing was, uh, Peter already mentioned the concept of group. He didn't use team 
which was very interesting because a team says, well, someone is in charge, right? A team lead, some sort of, you know, a captain or something. Over here, you don't have that. You literally have a group and the whole kind of, um, yeah, the process that I just described, actually you work as a group. So now question was, well, how do we apply that? Well, can you imagine a scrum team, for example, no scrum master, no PO, but actually they share the responsibility between them, which is much, much more powerful than say, hey, PO, you do this, or scrum master, you do that kind of thing. So that creates a much, much more active and much, much more, um, I should say, engaged team. So the responsibility is truly shared by everyone. So those are two things, the layering of, we, we just see, you know, probably one, two layers, but there's much, much more social science underneath, which unfortunately I'll have to go and study a bit more to pick up on these, all these other things that are kind of part and parcel, they're uh, inherent with the model, they come with the model, but you don't realize it until you start doing it. So that was fascinating. Thanks, Michal. Who would like to go next? Can I just have a small comment on what Mimi said? Because I completely agree with what you just said. I uh, I just want to highlight the um, which was a big aha moment for me because I've, as I said, I've read a little bit about this before, and I knew about, I read her book and everything, and I had a fair I thought I had a fairly good understanding. Of course, for example, the search company, I say, okay, there are steps, good, because you have to do it sequentially in one way or another. But I didn't think much through why this was before that and not the way around, for example, and stuff like that. And, uh, and also a colleague of mine, mine had been to an Agile enterprise course and they had been taught future search. And he presented that before I read about uh, the search conference. But so I thought, oh, they look very similar, right? Uh, they have to be the same thing. And also read up and yeah, okay, they had some history. There are some, there are some uh, connections there. And then I'm glad I asked Marilyn. <laughs> At the court, because we spent some time on the difference between the two, and they are essential. Uh, uh, what they did in future search, which is our, uh, so they had derived from from search coverage, they have changed the order of things. For example, they start with with the system and not the uh, environment, and that's a huge difference. It can seem like a trivial thing, like okay, we do the same thing, we just do it in a different order. How much does that matter? In the search conference, it matters a lot. And as you said, Michael, just starting with with the with with the, with the environment and the search and 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 so the search in, in the bigger global field and also some years ahead. So so you have so you can't rely on some existing knowledge. You you, you have to basically guess, right? And then everybody can guess. As as Eric have also also said, anyone can design it. You don't have to be an expert to to, to design. So I had an introduction to to my company yesterday about this, and I I, I gave the illustration of say if you started in in a company and this, and the second day or third day or something like that, you are invited in to do a search conference. How would you feel if you started with the history? You wouldn't have anything to say. You would you would feel like an utter noob, right? But when you start with this search for for, for the external field, you have a lot to contribute. contribute. Actually, as a as a newcomer, you probably had more to contribute than the people stuck in the existing system. So, as you said, Michal, there are layers to layers. They have tested this again and again and again, and it's structured like this for a reason. So you shouldn't change it. Thank you. <laughs> a bit of a rant, but <laughs> I'll, I'll thanks, just, Sean. I'll just build very quickly on on top of what Sean said because it uh, and and Michal said, like I I love the example you gave, Michal, in terms of just you know, we, we talk, we often talk about, you know, if we want to, you know, was it crucial conversations and things like that, you've got to find that higher purpose, shared higher purpose that enables you to, you know, to find it, it to, 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 to find the common ground that you can move forward. Um, all the way through the OST, um, those principles underlined, but it was introduced to us as practices. So we just did it, okay? So she didn't, it, it, um, Marilyn and, and Peter didn't tell us why we were necessarily doing it up front. They just, as if, as if we were doing a search conference, we just went through the steps and then naturally found at the end of it, oh yeah, we all of a sudden we found common purpose. And it, 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 just such a simple thing, just being able to disagree on something and very quickly say, well, we disagree on that. And having a board that you write this this is something we don't this, we don't agree on. This is now out of scope. 
unless the only time you can talk or bring that back into the conversation is if someone has a proposal of how we can actually resolve that problem. Otherwise, it's out of scope for the rest of the, you know, of the search conference or, or the PD. It sounds so little, but just having such a simple rule that can allow you guys to move forward, totally embracing the fact you disagree on something. And and, and those little, um, again, as Mihel and Tron said, you, you, the, there's very beautiful little touches which um, always, uh, uh, there was a note I saw uh, Martin and, um, and Dan were talking about um, how does it fit in with Agile? Well, I think there are, without getting into too much detail, there are sort of quite good parallels between aspects. Um, and I would say it's outcome orientated, people centered, which for me is pretty much all out, you know, agile approaches, they're outcome orientated, people centered. Um, I, I also feel that a lot of the research supports and, and and I think it's exactly what you said Martin in your comment it fills in the gaps with or, or explains the why behind um, uh, uh, why some of these agile approaches methods um, work or don't work actually I think in some of them thanks Andy um so you don't necessarily have to build up what Andy said if you have um, other aha moment or insight or yeah, anything I'll, that excites I'll, you. I'll, I'll chuck one in and also I think there's a question further down on what have you already tried from the OSD course from Martin as well. Um, one, of the, one of the things which was, I found like immediately practical in terms of what I was doing and not, I think it stands actually separate from um, OSD as something that can be used independently anyway. Um, not that you would ever do that Marilyn, don't come and hunt me down. Uh, were the, um, uh, the, the six criteria for um, uh, psychological requirements for productive activity. Um, th those are things I've already started to use, Martin, in the work that I'm doing, sometimes subtly to actually see, well, where do I think people are at or where teams are at or where organizations are at and these, these, diff these different things, but also to actually run workshops with teams on these things to uh, as, as a metric to see, well, are you moving towards something which is actually, you know, uh, sustainable and productive. Um, so yeah, there, there's, that's one of the things which is a really big aha moment for me in the course. And it's really similar to a lot of things that I've seen and heard before in terms of like criteria for success within organizations and very DP2 model as well. And in terms of what it um, tries to achieve. What are uh, the six criteria, David? So, you wanna just briefly. I, I will, I wanted to say that quickly because I can get bogged down in the six criteria for an hour. So. Um, Number one is elbow room or autonomy of decision making. Uh, number two is continual learning for which there has to be the ability to set goals, but also accurate and timely feedback. Yes, I'm reading from the book. Um, variety, that there has to, but, but these top three also are um, uh, not maximal. They're on a, a scale of like from minus five to positive five and ideal is zero. Okay, you don't have too much of these and you don't have too little. The third one is variety. So that's an easy one to explain. Too little variety is boring. Too much variety is like hard to, is, is overwhelm. Um, mutual support and respect. Uh, so the last three are maximal. You can't have enough of these things. You can't have um, too much mutual support and respect. Uh, meaningfulness, uh, which consists of doing something which is socially valuable and seeing the whole of the product or service that you're working within. And the last one is having a concept of a desirable future, both at a personal level and at a group level. So they're the six things that I've already started to apply in the work that I'm doing probably badly, but I'm starting to see some good results from just um, my ham-fisted way of actually bringing those things as, as metrics to um, the people that I'm working with as well. Thanks, Dave. Anyone uh, else? I, again, Dave, I've started using those as well. Um, it's mm -hmm. like the damn pink, you know, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Yeah, but it is. So th these are sort of research and and a little bit more detailed and and yeah. if anything, I think um, resonates more with people. Um, yeah. And I, I I've been talking to the CRO at my new 
place. I've been talking, uh, uh, had a great conversation with a lady today who was basically saying we don't have time to re to uh, to bring people in to design this. We need to get external consultants in, and I and I just put up the six psychological principles. And she was, it, it, it stopped her in her tracks because we were able to go through it and just go, well, we could do that, but you you know, you're running a 32% um, turnover of staff. You've said that's been going on for three years. Okay, let's have a look at this. And does this exist now? And does your approach to solving this actually reinforce or, or, or you know make this better or reinforce it and it was like yeah it's going to make them all worse yeah exactly so coming back what do you want to do and she's you know it so yeah that's that's exactly the one i've been using um as a as an immediate something you can you can bring into work And that's Humanals. from all the way back in all the way back in 1969 with Emory and Fawcett. So that's really quite something that's been around for a long time. It's also not exclusive. If you want to add more dimensions to it, you can. So things like uh, concepts of belonging can be added. But um, what they say is these are the basic set. And you're right. A, a further subset would be autonomy, mastery, and purpose, uh, as well in terms of its intrinsic motivation. Thanks, Dave. Anyone else, Tron, Monica? Did you want to, or Russ? Russ have been very quiet as well. Ah, oh, okay. We'll, we'll, you come back later, Russ. <laughs> if you're having your dinner. Yeah, okay, cool. We'll come back to you later. Um, you guys, anything you want to add? Yeah, I do just just small comment about the six criteria. Um, a little brag, it's that they were discovered in Norway. At the, <laughs> there was a very interesting project going, uh, going on there in the 60s and 70s. So it was in 1967, I think. It was described uh, in a book together with a Norwegian author. But anyway, uh, uh, since you mentioned Pink, um, I have been fascinated by Pink for a while. And also, uh, there, is a, there is another theory called self-determination theory, uh, which had similar things to what Pink has. But Pink, in, uh, I think he had, uh, instead, uh, he, he removed relatedness uh, from the self-determination theory. And, that, and, the, and I think that's a big difference, because the six criteria contains all those criteria from Pink and also from self-determination the, 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 the theory, right? So, and relatedness here is so important. That people feel uh, in, in a social group, and that's completely not in Pink's thinking. Mary American, I don't know <laughs> what's the reason, but yeah. Thank you, Ross or Monica. Did you wanna? Yeah, Ross. yeah. Uh, yeah I, I wanted to jump in. I think um, if if I wanted to go back to kind of the things that. That kind of surprised me or, or intrigued me for, from the course, and, and one was was the conversations that we were having, um, and very lucky to have like mom and people with other backgrounds come in. But one thing that, that I found from the conversation we were, we were having that there's a kind of disillusionment with um, the current state of the agile world and the type of work that we're, we're doing, and that people are looking for a more, uh, a, a different approach. And I guess what really resonated with me was this idea that, you know, through a search conference that it's this idea of the DB2, it's the group that are making the decisions together about the work and about their future. And that really resonated with me. And I, I think Trond alluded to it earlier about, this is why I got into this type of work. You know, this is why I wanted to change organizations. This was kind of the reason that I was kind of got into this this agile field of, of change and, and organizational design and, and things like that. And that was to support structures that empower the people doing the work to make the decisions, uh, returning to the, the real fundamentals. And, and certainly I feel that, that that was the aspiration of agile. What I see in the agile industrial complex that's pretty mainstream I don't see, I see the DP1 structures, I see a hierarchy, you know, and ultimately, uh, I think Ali Dad put a post on LinkedIn the other day that succinctly summed this up, 
we can tune your feature factory up and we can make it go faster with your, you know, your release trains and whatnot. But this is not, this is not empowering the people to, to own and manage the work. You know, at the end of the day, there's a portfolio backlog that's prioritized that goes to a release train backlog that goes to a team backlog and people in the team are just told to pull the next one from the, from the list. So uh, for me, there was this common feeling uh, about Agile, are we, are we really kind of meeting our, our fundamental things? And then the deep insight that we're missing that deep democracy part. Right, Mom, what's, what was your Thanks, insight? Russ. I, I, I think for me it was quite, um, it was a very different experience because I, I wasn't, <laughs> I, I come from a different type of background. I don't work in Agile with folks that, you know, share so many commonalities. So I was a bit of a, the fish out of water, sort of. Um, but for me, it raised, um, the, the, the hard moment for me was that how, you know, complexity theory can actually uh, come to play with, with groups, if, you know, and, and the clients that I work with in terms of you know using this type of design i i think one of the the interesting things is that um through time we've and, and i've seen that a lot in agile um with the folks that i work not necessarily with these folks this was the first time that i ever meet them but there's a, a lot of a rush to action you know this is what what's in front of us and then we're going to go and do it i think um using this type of methodology uh allows people especially if you get to deliver those those types of teams it um it, it gets people to actually uh, be accountable for a, a performance uh and so there's brings into this environment a lot more collaboration rather than competition so my observations have been that uh, in this particular group there is a lot of um uh, you know people that are very self authored with very, very strong opinions. <laughs> and sometimes it feels like a war uh, or some kind of battle that is going on. But but because you, you have this dialogic uh, sort of tension that goes through the whole discovery process, which is the searching and then the PDW. And then when you get moved into your teams to actually be accountable for something as, as, as a whole, um, I uh, or group, I'm sorry, um, uh, I think it could be very, very interesting to see that shift in an industry where it's, you know, loaded by who who writes the best code uh, or, you know, quickest, uh, you know, where does this stop? So I, I think it could, could bring a different sense to, to an industry. So that was what I thought it could. For me, it, it's a possibility. And, and I see this, this kind of work as a possibility for 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 different things to happen to an industry so i'm quite excited about it thanks Juan. um i may also share some of my experiences there was a lot there was many many aha moments for me one of the key uh, attraction was the whole active adaptation angle um but where you know as a system you not only you're influenced by your environment but you're also influencing your environment a lot of this stuff in agile is about responding to change rather than influencing your environment to change so and and that was a that was a great way of actually the search conference was a way of looking at how do you design active adaptive objectives um but for me there were many uh, one of them was a big aha moment where I found connection between viable system model and OSD. And it was when we started to apply DP2 design principle too, when we move into um, self-managing groups um, and, and, and how do you create a self-managing organization? And it was, it was really, you know, what happened when teams start to take, start to do control and coordination of their work themselves and then design their own way of working so what happens to the managers and it was a big aha moment for me where well you know those that still stay uh, they start looking at a different function for example they get into um, planning or they get into um, strategy and and 
initially I thought, oh, okay, you know, the managers go to a strategy, but then I realized it is not about managers that go to a strategy. It's anyone with that experience begin to work on those things. So there is a hierarchy there, um, but it is not a hierarchy of roles or hierarchy of dominant personality or power. It's a hierarchy of function. So when someone in the strategy is not the boss of someone in operation, it's just they do productive work, which is about a strategy. And someone in the planning is long-term planning is they do productive work, but they're not necessarily the boss of people who are doing the, the, the teams, right? So, and, and the other aspect of it is even those folks now have to work um, as a group uh, with the design principle too. So, which is very rarely in organizations, you know, most executive teams or management team, they are individuals, they're competing with each other. Right. So as soon as you move up from a team and you get into the management, whether it's supervisory, middle management, senior or executive, there is no such a thing as a team. You are on your own. You're competing with everyone else. You have your own goals and objectives and KPIs. But with a OST um, um, sort of inspired or OST approach to organizations, even the leadership team have to now operate as a team. There is no such thing as a leadership team anymore, actually. They become, you know, the, the strategy folks and the planning folks. And that was the connection to a viable system model for me where, you know, system one is um, effectively all of your um, DP2 self-managing teams. Um, the difference was system two also get merged into system one. And then the, 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 you have the system three, which is, you know, planning, long-term planning, the time span. You know, if your teams are working on here and now, then someone in the, you know, management team begin to look at the future. And then you have system four, which is a strategy. And, and I think the, the beauty of it is the ethos of the organization and where we have system five. Then in my head, I was mapping it with, our board of directors, they are the ones who decide about the identity of the organization and high level policy, et cetera. Suddenly that whole system five is actually the entire system. By going through the search conference, you're actually deciding about your future, your identity, um, and a lot of policy come from there. So um, that was one of the big aha moments. Well, there is hierarchy, but it's hierarchy of function rather than roles that are personal dominant. And, and there was a lot of connection to, for me to um, viable system model, which excite me actually. I've picked it up as my, one of my research. So I'm, I'm actually studying it more and more and try to bring the two together. And um, yeah, that was one of my aha moments. The other one, which I don't go into detail was, there was a funny moment where you know, in agile communities, Tuckman model is actually is one of the most used model for group dynamics. And effectively, we ask, we, we talk, tell Marilyn about it. Yeah, oh, that's just BS. What? So 20 years of experience and basing a lot of practice. Of what do you mean? Oh, you know, Tuckman, everyone in social science, no. You know, Tuckman did it in a very, very contained group it was never generalized it never turned into science there is no science behind it it works on very very specific cases and it changes so yes it works with very rare and exceptional cases and i was like oh <laughs> you know i'm not gonna say it in, in a group of agile folks because effectively what is been for 20 years of working on an assumption poof and um she did offer some alternatives for group dynamics, which I don't go into, but I think it was a, a reminder again that in Agile, we do a, a lot of work we do is about people, but there is very limited people science in what we do. We've mostly become process coaches, right? Um, and very little social science, which is, you know, if you want to get into business of change, and it's not just about Agile, right? Business of change and organization, we need to look into a lot more into um, sociology, um, a lot more than what we are used to. So that was my kind of big insight. Can, can, I, can, I, can I build on that, uh, Ali? Because uh, it was a powerful moment because um, uh, Dr. Marilyn is 
is quite hard of hearing. So when she, she tells you, <laughs> she had to walk very close to you. And then she was like, it's bullshit, right, right in your face. And uh, that was a priceless moment for me. Um, but, and this actually chimes with something that uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph uh, Pellrine said at the Scrum Australia conference as well. Um, he talked about Tuckman's model being um, used in group therapy sessions for, for mental patients. And so um, it, I think that, that was a thing that I picked up, a rigor, a rigor around these models. I think uh, agilists in particular are very guilty of being magpies, of picking tools up here and there without really reading the source material, without validating it and reusing it. And you see it everywhere. You see the same things picked up again and again and again. And really lacking rigor, you know, rigor and deep research uh, and meaningful um, kind of inspection of these assumptions that people make in this kind of common cultural mail. Um, Thank you. Yeah, oh, look, I mean, come on. I mean, Ross, come on. Um, yeah, it's your right, of course. But um, I mean, social science, for goodness sake, they've gone through how many years now of a reproducibility crisis? So um, I, I think there can be a bit of hair shirtism going in on, on there as well. Yes, a lot of what we use is bullshit. Um, but a lot of what is used in the world of business is bullshit. So um, that is partly due to complexity. But to say that we can become completely rigorous, which uh, I don't think you're actually saying, is um is probably a bridge too far um it sounds like yeah it, it's of course it's welcome to bring more more rigor i mean i think what's suggestive of this is like if if one is guilty of magpieing or, or cherry picking to use the, the more common term how can one bring more rigor to one's practice and be more questioning in what one does rather than taking whatever sounds good and using it as dogma um what I find a little bit concerning is the the possibility that we go, aha, we found the new dogma, which is OST. Now I know everyone here is much too wonderful to do that, but it um it, it is uh it, you know, I don't think we're gonna find the solution to all our to all our problems. Um, you know, aha, the new religion. But uh, yeah, thank you for my rant. Yeah, um Dan, I just sort of wanted to um I, I think you're right, 100 spot on in terms of, you know, OST is not for everybody. I, I think one of the interesting things with OST is that is, um, as I said, it's, it's not replicable. So what, what happened somewhere else cannot happen in your organization because your environment will be different. The people that come to the search conference will be different. They are bringing a different part of the puzzle. So it's very, it's grounded theory. So when you're using any methodology that is grounded on your context, you have, I think, a better chance of it being fit for function. So for whatever you're using it. Um, the other thing that it's probably if if you were to use, um, so you know the because the, there is like a protocol or a way, it's probably much easier to use than if you were unused. Um, it's, you know, a design based on complexity theory where, where you were doing it and you hadn't read up or know what the other bits are, are there. So I think in terms of how is easy to handle, you know, how is easy to manage, how is easy to do, I think is is very accessible. Um, and and I think the the thing that, <clears throat> you know, for, for me uh, has been a uh, I think exciting about those six days uh, that I was with a bunch of these these folks that I didn't know or lived in the world uh, was the fact that um, methodolog methodologies like this allow you to to think to engage in thinking before you act and not just in thinking but in actually finding what's the meaning of what I'm doing um, and I think what, what you've been describing is how do you cultivate as a community, you know, your own sense of inquiry, your own sense of what, what's the lead test and when, when do you're actually really, really uh, trying to discover something rather than 
trying to find out who's top dog. <laughs> and I, I found that uh, I think the greatest tension in this community, which is, you know, when do you actually engage in inquiry and, and you are and you are right, not, not everything is perfect, but how do you know? And one of the things with um, that, that I don't think anybody has pointed out yet is that the book searching is actually a retake of basically going back and examining what they had done for 20 or so years and trying to find out why it didn't work. I found very few scholars that actually go back and look at their work and find out why it didn't work. So whatever we're reading in searching is basically what they found out wasn't working. And as I said, I don't think these methodologies are for everybody. <laughs> I, I don't prescribe to that. Um, I, I'm a careful cheerleader, <laughs> uh, but but it's for, for those folks that actually think that organizations um, are seeking for better outcomes and just not for profit. And one of the things that my biggest aha moment was that I have been, I, it made me feel, it sort of made me a little bit depressed. It made me feel that I have been working as an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, because no matter what I did, the outcomes in terms of people outcomes were not going to be great. Now, there are not that many studies about mental health or, you know, um, different health indicators in the um, IT, you know, tech, tech, uh, telecommunications sort of part. I, I've been looking for it and I could only find a study that was done in India, but I do a little bit of work of some of the Silicon Valley stuff. And we know that there is a, a number of, you know, uh, cases of substance abuse, uh, you know, not having a life, you know. So there's a lot of stuff that is undocumented. So in, in terms of these, the way that the, the work that you guys do and the fit for these, it may be a better fit than other things. So, um, so it's, it's something to explore rather than to adopt. I think between the adoption and exploration, there are a few steps, so that that does I don't work uh, in uh, with, with with IT companies, but this this that was just my feel. Sorry, that was the biggest. No, no, thanks, Monica. I I I apologize. I need to go. Uh, my daughter is calling me. Have been calling me for a while. Um, and um, just one thing that uh, OSC is mostly based on action research, and it's different to hypothesis driven. Um, search because with action research you acknowledge that you're working with humans and human unfortunately as opposed to a computer or a river or or the dynamic of a i don't know a flute people change their mind and unfortunately the values change so you can't have a hypothesis that remains forever you gotta do that through action research and then keep reiterating. And Monica also touched on some of that. I need to go, but um, I'm, I'm so glad. Um, thank you so much for coming here. Um, I'll leave, but for rest of the folks, I can't, they can stay for as long as possible. Um, one of our aims to, is to start this community. And the beauty of the training was after we did the search conference on PDW, we've already built a community. And that was my other aha moment. I already done search type conferences before, but the reason it didn't pick up is we didn't build a community that carry the objectives of the search. And I, I'm hoping that there was enough interest for you to continue this and please reach out to any of the panelists um, and let's continue the conversation. I'll have to go, but some of the folks will still stay. Tell that, just uh, make me a host. So okay, we'll do. Connection. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, the whole conference will close. All right, thanks. We'll do. Yeah, so we are uh, guys pa past the uh, end that we booked for this, but we still can take exactly as Elliot said a couple of more questions. Um, anyone in particular, just go for it. We can probably take one or two more. I feel I've left my list list and had a rant up there, so. You know, <laughs> leave it open to anyone. But if you like any of the other questions of mine, you're happy. I'm happy for you too. Thanks, Andy. But many of them have been, have been, several have been addressed along the way. So thank you so much Thanks, for that. Uh, Gail, I noticed that, that you uh, had a few uh, questions. Did you get those answered in the chat? Or? Uh, 
Sorry, Tron, just, just before I go, I, just, I just want to build on Monica's point. There are definitely contexts in which I really struggled to see how this would apply. But then, as I loved your rather depressing analogy of being the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, Monica, but um, with those contexts, the theory that this helps me realise that they they're perhaps the ones you need to just walk away from because they ain't being helped um, or they're not being helped in a way which is going to perhaps optimise people's uh, 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 well-being and um, effectiveness. So, anyway, thanks all. Thanks, Andy. What, what, did, I, what did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys, so if... Uh... As Ali had said, please feel free to reach out if uh, more questions pop up after this. Um, it's for us also important to keep this dialogue going. We just want to see how rest of the community feels about this. So uh, we are looking at, as OST says, that extended field around our uh, small group. But uh, yeah, please do uh, uh, reach out. Uh, we do have a lot of resources that you can uh, read up on uh, yourself. And any closing remarks from any of the panelists? Uh, just quickly, Mahal, um, I'm involved with uh, helping a group in North America called the STS Roundtable to relaunch themselves. And they're very keen to hear about how you guys are uh, thinking about using OST to enhance the service offer offering of Agile. They think that's a really great way to reach out to their wider community and also attract members that are more diverse and younger. Because <laughs> of a lot of them are a pale white old blokes like me. <laughs> Hey, hey, Peter, what happened? Well, I mean, there were a couple of questions. What, what, in your view, like historically, like it seemed that there was a kind of a heyday and then it dropped off. Yeah, it, um, oh, I could talk about that for hours. Um, <laughs> there, there was a lot of uh, interest in, in OST back in the, uh, the 1990s when, um, particularly manufacturing companies were in dire straits because in Australia they were reducing tariffs and companies had to compete globally. So there was a lot of interest then. And then um, you get all these different management fads flowing through over the years. So, um, yeah, they, they seem to take people's attention and then they drop off. But OST is... Now, it rises to the surface, but it's always there, even though it, you know, m people may not be uh, cognizant of it. It's always, always there and, and developing. And it, um, it's, it's been discussed before, but it's, it's a methodology that works. As Maryland's um, uh, website, it's called Social Science that actually works. And where all the threads and published and unpublished papers in Maryland's as well are up there. And um, it, it's not the human relations part of social science, which is an example of uh, that would be uh, turning supervisors into team leader coach, coaches, being warm, fuzzy, friendly people. Um, people know that that doesn't work. so. The uh, there's so much in open systems theory. We just touched the tip of the iceberg. I mean, Fred was a polymath, and he was ex had expertise in a lot of uh, things to do with people, even things like the search conference. Uh, if you ever get the chance to be involved with one, um, you come out with very high levels of energy because you've actually created a desirable and achievable future for the organisation or the community you're working on. Uh, and that's why they're limited to two days, because the energy levels are so high. If you keep 
uh, people at that high level of energy, they find it very hard to wind down. And I found it very hard to wind down in a couple of searches as well because you're, you're thinking about what you've developed. Um, and so there's, there's a whole lot of stuff behind this OST that we could maybe explore at another session. Um, even the things like the human ideals which are expressed during the search conference, they're very, very powerful motivators more powerful than the six criteria or the intrinsic motivators that Dave was talking about earlier. So there's, um, yeah, there's so much for practitioners and academics that could learn from OST. My, my I, I'm just a, a pure application person. I've, understood theory and then by trial and error and hard knocks I've actually applied it over the years. But there's so much more that I don't know about that um, others could pick up and and take with and uh, share it across the... Yeah. Uh, I, I think the other thing, Peter, is we have to be honest that well, I think one of the reasons why OST hasn't um, been popularised is because there I think the primaries didn't have an interest in popularizing it. Um, uh, they, yeah, that's correct. They want it to be successful and they want it to be effective. They don't want it to be, you know, a t shirt and a mug and a pithy saying. Uh, and yeah. I think Fred sort of personified that with um, his response in a talk at ANU, I think, to where the BH, where BHP was present and he didn't mince words and probably lost, I think, a lot of opportunity for OST in that, in that space. But you know, that was Fred. Um, I think there was yeah. a, a lot of stuff that we learned about the personalities involved in OST and, you know, they don't really put up with bullshit. They, they yeah. really don't want to um, hang about and make it popular. Now, we have, a, I think, a, a bit of a responsibility to work on the diffusion. We don't want to work on diffusion, which loses the essence at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so, really uh, hard. Yeah. So I'm helping. I'm helping you. To, to, I'm helping you to diffuse it through that STS roundtable, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. I think a mug's so, a good way to go, mate. We could we could sell a mug with the ideals yeah. that we make a fortune. I think. Awesome. Or like like make a make a America great again. One of those caps, you know. <laughs> Nice. Oh, make our ST great again. I've got I've got, I've got yeah. my next T-shirt sorted. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Any other comments, guys? Any other comments? This is a lot of yeah. fun, but we'll have to I'm, stop I'm at some point. Just yep. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add my five cents worth in here. I'm brand new to this stuff, right? Like I've, I don't even know what this was, but it seemed interesting. So I thought I'll just jump in and see what happens. And it's been fascinating, really fascinating. I wanted to share an experience I had. I don't know if it was OST or not, but. As a, an employee of a telco company a few years ago, we were involved in setting our own KPIs in the call center. And reflecting on what you've been talking about, the way that that session was run and shaped was um, using the external environment factors or the other factors uh, the 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 play around why KPIs are such and 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 the like. But I walked out of that session and I still reflect on it as one of the best experiences I've had in my working life. I just felt we, we came out where like it was all of us, we were staff, right? We were the people on the phones getting to set our own KPIs and we were able to negotiate them as well and go, okay, well, we think this, we think that, and we think this is too high and this should be more like this. But the way we felt and felt empowered at that particular point in time to this day it felt like some sort of dark arts people were practicing on us because we walked out and went, you know, where were the advocates? So I just, from a personal experience, something like that was an incredibly powerful experience just from the person that's on the ground doing the work. Great think, example. Some, some of the stuff that we, we've come across as, as people working in the agile space, um, a lot of the stuff that uh, around software organizing teams of uh, democratizing your work of building cross-functionality these all have like strong sort of correlation if you like if not um, direct sort of like um, 
uh, sort of links through to DP2 type approaches, which is at the uh, um, the core of, 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 of open systems theory as well. So yeah, it, it's almost, it's, it's amazing. I'm sure Dan, if we sat down and went through a lot of the things that we've experienced in the agile space, we could find the, the oh, this is really similar to that and that is similar to that. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff out there that like, as we were talking about stuff in, you know, I think, oh, I've sort of done that in this, but it was slightly different because of that. So there's all that sort of stuff that is is there. Yeah, I, th I think it might be helpful to, you know, use some of those moving forward. Like, Aladad sent me a heap of stuff, and I, like, was, I think, like <laughs> Maha said, tried to read some of the search books three times. Or mm. um, it's, and, and I really appreciate those comments, Peter, about, you know, focuses on popularization and and what it takes um, for for things to cross cross in and become more mainstream. It it ain't easy. Um, and if you're going to start a cult, you need a, the right personalities, probably. Yeah. Uh, I I just yeah. So I reckon it would be really valuable to um, to yeah to sort of work through. I guess some of those scenarios that those of us in agile and organizational change and continuous improvement run into and where does OST shed light? Where does it reinforce? Where does it give a different, give a different angle? Um, I'm sure that would be, would be, would be yeah. fascinating, you know, and I think there are probably subtle, subtle distinctions um, as well. Yeah. I've ta taken some, some notes. Yeah, I, I basically, I've had a lot going on in my life, so I couldn't make it. And I was like going, oh, I wonder how it'll go and will, whether they'll be able to reformulate it in a way where we can go, yeah, 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 we all, we know about these bits. You know, that's like we've learned, but we got this this section wrong and this is where you should be focusing and this is where the unlearnings have to, have to happen and the relearning. So, you know, the old wine sometimes has to come into new bottles, sometimes... Um, and then there's the there's all the contextual stuff that that everyone's talking about. So I look forward to learning more. But I've got yep, human ideals and those six criteria are part of mm. it. But then I also take uh, Tron's point about there's there's some real thinking about sequencing and yeah and so forth. So mm. thanks. For awesome. Getting into it. Cool. Any last words, guys? If not. I want to thank you all and everyone who was here before. It was an awesome discussion. So we'll most likely post this within the next uh, couple of days. Uh, so you can catch it up on that uh, YouTube channel. Uh, other than that, um, looking forward to our next one. And as Peter said, perhaps we should have another one or two of these session with a bit more perhaps focused area. This was just kind of a broad uh, thing, but we could kind of dive into. Dan is is would love to uh, attend to some of those. So not to replace the course, by the way, the course is totally a different kettle of fish, but just kind of to focus and clarify perhaps some of the areas that I see might be of interest. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks, thanks all of you. Mahal. And thanks. until next time. Yeah, thank you thanks very much. Bye bye. 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 bye.